So good afternoon. This course is using vector calculus to provide or to solve problems um, in electricity and magnetism. So it's really to solve problems. So just forgive the missing typo. Using vector calculus to solve problems in electricity and magnetism. I'm Dr. Richardson. Here is my email address listed. And again, this is lecture six of the course. So a reminder again, um, the best way to learn the materials to take active notes and not to simply sit back and look at the video clips. The problem sets are essential in terms of understanding the material. So lecture uh, problem set five, that was available last Tuesday. Um, the solution key to problem set five will be posted on the Google Drive probably next Monday. And problem set six will be posted on Google Drive also probably by um, early uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday morning or late afternoon. Again, um, I'm available at the email address listed above. So please feel free to use that as a mechanism to ask questions uh, available during the week and weekends, and I can respond to um, questions in real time, well, about 24 hours. So it's also advised that you use a ruler in doing the problems, and as you see, we've been using that throughout the lectures. So, um, what we've been doing our set of problems in which we have been able to solve for the electric field. And so we're going to continue that process today. So last time we used, we solved for the electric field due to two point charges. We solved for the electric field for a linear, infinite a line of uniform linear charge density, lambda. And we also uh, solved for the electric field for the case of a circular loop, which again had a linear charge density. So we are going to do problem, which is a slight wrinkle of that last problem. So again, in many ways, this is sim similar to the problem we looked at last time at the end of lecture five, but I'll repeat it. So I have a three-dimensional coordinate system. Here are my necessary unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat. And for the moment, I'm going to write in a picture of my wire bent in the form of a circular loop. This wire has a radius A. And if you think about this, we did this problem last time where we calculated the electric field at some point B, sorry, try it again. We calculate the electric field in this system at some point, which we call P, the points of vectors, so we could put that in. So the distance from the origin to P is Z, the distance from the differential line element of the circular loop to P was given by R. And again, in cylindrical polar coordinates or, or uh, plane polar coordinates, the distance um, from the center of the loop to there is, let me be a little bit more careful. So that's X and Y. 
And why don't we just use a ruler to put in the y-axis. Okay, so there we are. So the problem we're gonna look at this afternoon is a rod bent into the form of a, not a circle this time, but a semicircle. And it's gonna have a radius of A. So it is going to be useful to see what that looks like. And so that follows from figure one. In a new figure, figure two, and be very careful about this. Recognize that I had in this picture, I'm looking at the XY plane, so I hat points downward and J hat points to the right direction. So I'm not gonna worry about a finite circle in this problem. I'm worried about a semicircle. And again, it has a radius of A. And if you think about it, this is the angle phi in plane polar coordinates. So, so before we write down any equations, we just think about this and compare this to the circular loop problem in uh, illustrated in figure one. The difference between that problem and this problem in figure Roman numeral two is that uh, phi, the azimuthal angle, is going to go from zero to pi in figure two. Whereas in the previous problem, figure one, it went from zero to two pi. That's really the main difference in the problem, okay? But even that little subtle change is gonna be enough to see uh, a difference in what's going on. Okay, so that's the problem at hand. So we have this rod bent into a form of semicircle of a semicircle of radius A. And what I want to do is to find the electric field for my semicircle at point P. That's the task at hand. Okay. Again, this rod is going to be very, very thin, so we're going to neglect any structure in the rod. So essentially, it's a, it's a, well, it has width of zero, but it's going to have a linear charge density of lambda. Same thing as we saw last time. Okay, so in many ways, this problem is done in a very similar fashion to the previous problem. We looked at lecture five. So I don't mind repeating this, but I'm gonna do it with the caveat that I'm just gonna draw the picture for the full circle because it's gonna be easier for me to do that. And then when it comes time to do the azimuthal integration, I can see what's going on. So this is Z, this is R, this is rho. Again, my wire has a linear charge density lambda, or my circle has a linear charge density lambda, and the radius is A. Where if you think about it, lambda is just the charge over the entire circumference of the wire, which is two pi A. So what do we need to do? We need to calculate the electric field at this point P. What we, we need to do is follow the same prescription that we've been using. Namely, if you just look at in red, this differential, the small piece of charge of the circular loop, it'll generate an electric field at point P and that electric field will just be DE. DQ generates an electric field DE. And then if you wanna get the entire electric field, what you have to do is integrate over the entire loop. Or again, since we're doing a semicircle, we'll integrate over the semicircle, not the complete loop. We'll worry about that next time.
uh, a little bit later. So DE is just DQ r hat divided by four pi epsilon naught r squared. It's clear what r is. DQ is lambda dl r hat divided by four pi epsilon naught dr. So we need to figure out how to deal with three things, dl, r hat, and r. So first things first, the differential line element is something that we can easily write down from our knowledge of cylindrical polar coordinates in the xy plane i have rho and d phi so this arc length is just rho d um rho d phi so dl the differential line element in uh so in polar, uh, plane polar coordinates, it's just rho times d phi. So I know what that is. Okay. Now, the second thing, again, we talked about this before. Don't mind repeating it. My unit vector r hat is not a constant. It depends upon where you are in space. It has an angular dependence. So I can't pull it out of the integral. But what I can do is write it in terms of unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat, and those guys are constants. And we've used this trick a lot. So again, a position vector r is just r hat times its norm. So I can turn r hat into the position vector in a numerator, but there's a price to pay. The price is that the denominator gets modified, r squared now becomes r cubed. So I still have to calculate r and its magnitude, set those up, and then I should be ready to try to do this integral. Okay. So, I'll keep my figure for the moment. Again, warning, I have a picture of a circular loop. I am doing solving the problem for a semicircle, I know. And I'll take that into account later when I do the angle over the uh, integration over the azimuthal angle. So this is going to be lambda. Lambda is a constant, so it comes out times the integral rho d phi of r divided by four pi epsilon naught r cubed. Excuse me. Again, by looking at this problem, r is a vector that's generated our point from DL to point P. So it's generated by taking minus rho and adding it to plus Z. In cylindrical polar coordinates, this is simply minus rho I hat cosine phi plus, or actually minus, rho j hat sine phi plus k hat z. So the magnitude of r is simply obtained by taking the position vector, dotting it into itself, and then taking its square root. And that's just going to give you rho squared plus z squared all to the one half power.
Okay, and you should recognize in this problem that rho, since I'm using a, uh, I'm looking at the problem of charge distributed over a semicircular wire, rho is a constant, it's simply A. So, I'm gonna spread this out a bit, give myself a little bit more room. So the full integral that I need to evaluate is gonna look like lambda. I'll pull out the four pi epsilon naught. And then I will pull out A. And the only thing that's left in the denominator in the numerator integrate over is the azimuthal angle. And then I have my position vector in cylindrical polar coordinates. And the numerator, the numerator is given as such, and the denominator is here. So this is the integral we need to evaluate, and we need to do this over the semicircle. Okay, so let's roll up our sleeves, start. So you can see that the problem breaks down to three separate problems. And at this stage, I don't really need to figure it anymore. All the information from the figure I've gleaned. Okay, so I have three integrals or three expressions for the electric field that I need to evaluate. How do I know that? Well, here they are. Here's number one, because the I hat gives you a contribution vector contribution. Here's the contribution to E sub two due to J hat. And there'll be a third and final contribution due to the unit vector K hat. Okay, so um, let's just start. We'll do each one of these integrals separately, and then we'll add them up. So why not start with E1? What's the electric field due to the first integral? Okay, so that's gonna be formally lambda. Well, let's pull out a, let's leave it in there. You know, pull out a minus sign and we'll pull out the other A. So we'll get A squared times I hat and four pi times the permittivity of free space. All those guys are constants. So we'll pull these out. We're doing an integral over phi, cosine of phi, over a squared plus z squared, all to the three halves power. So whenever you do an integral, it's important to ask what is a variable and what's a constant. In this problem, the radius of the semicircle is constant, so A is a constant. Z is a constant. In other words, I want to evaluate the electric field at a specific point. So Z is fixed or it's a constant. And it's really only one variable, B. So this is really a pretty easy integral. I mean, from here, the problem is just calculus, but the integral is very easy to do at this stage, at least Z sub one, because this term one over a squared plus z squared to the three halves power is just a constant. And so all I have to do now, sorry, let's be a little bit more careful, just to the three halves power. All I have to do now is evaluate this as a musical angle uh, integral. So, um, here is where all the action comes into play. I have a semicircle. So the azimuthal angle is only gonna go from zero to pi, not two pi. 
This is an elementary integral. I leave it to you to evaluate, and you should recognize that, in fact, it vanishes. So there's not going to be a contribution at all from e sub 1. Okay, simply zero. Now, let's move on. I'll keep the general form at the top of the board because the integral I need to evaluate for E sub two is going to be very similar. The difference will be is that I replace the I hat by J hat and I will replace cosine of phi by sine of phi. Everything else is the same. So same trick. A is just the radius of the semicircle. Z is fixed because you're evaluating the electric field at a particular point. So minus lambda squared, minus lambda a squared j hat over four pi epsilon naught times one over a squared plus z squared to the three halves power. All those guys are constants. And again, I have a semicircle, so I'm integrating the um, azimuthal angle from phi equals zero to phi equals pi. So this, again, is an elementary integral. And I leave it to you to evaluate. And it turns out that this guy is not zero. It doesn't vanish. And so it's very easy to show that in fact, you will get minus two lambda a squared j hat divided by four pi epsilon naught times a squared plus z squared to the three halves power. Essentially when you do this integral, you're just gonna get a factor of two. Okay, so two down, one to go. So remember E1, I'll put a semicolon there, E1 is zero and E2 is not zero. So our final integral to do, let's just do this on a clean board, is just E3. And so you go back and look at what it is, it's lambda times A times K hat times z, and z again is a constant, a is a constant, they come outside the integral. And then you're left with an integral of the same form as e1 and e2. But again, I'll say this again, a and z are constants. The only variable in this problem is v. So let's take advantage of that pull it outside, pull the denominator of the integrand outside since a and z are constants. And the same trick as the previous two integrals, I have a squared plus z squared to the three halves power outside. And now I have a much simpler integral to evaluate azimuthal angle, the integral over the azimuthal angle. And it's just Again, it goes over the length of the semicircle is zero to pi. So this is a simple integral to do. And your result will just be A or alpha A K hat Z divided by four, it is no pi, because the pi got disappeared, got killed when you did that as a mutual in interval, times a squared plus z squared to the three halves power. Okay, so we're finished. The electric field really only has two non-zero contributions, E1 and E2. Uh, E2 was minus, to lambda 
a squared j hat plus four pi epsilon naught a squared plus z squared to the three halves power. And the second contribution from E sub three is just written above. She is lambda a k hat z. Um, let's be a little bit more uniform with our convention and we'll put it this way. Lambda a z k hat. And that's divided by four epsilon. Again, the same denominator, a squared plus z squared, all quantity raised to the three halves power. And so that is my electric field at that point P, which is just a distance Z above the origin for my semicircle. I've, done, I've set up the problem and I've done everything I'm supposed to do. So again, this expression is complicated. And you may or may not believe it. But one thing you can do is try to see if you understand this thing, at least in some limiting cases. And we'll do one limiting case in the lecture today. And the other one I'll leave as an exercise for you in uh, problems in problem set six. So the limiting case we're going to look at uh, right above here. I'll keep my expression downstairs for the electric field. I don't want to erase it and have to rewrite it. That's a waste of energy. So the limiting case I want to consider now is what happens when z is zero. In other words, I have my circular loop, my circular, semicircular loop. If you go back to the figure, you recognize that downward is the direction of i hat, and there's the direction of j hat. This is the xy plane. So this is the point where z equals zero. So what we're asking is, what is the electric field at this point in space? Well, you can sit down and write a very uh, a uh, straightforward expression for that. Um, by basically just looking at this term. This term is simple because it vanishes when z is zero. Is a z in, a num in the numerator. So it's just algebra at this point to sit down and evaluate what the electric field is at that point. Z e equals zero. It's minus two lambda a j hat over four pi epsilon not a. And here's where you have to sit down and ask yourself, do I really believe what I've derived? This minus sign, which we claim belongs there as a result of the calculation, is not a mistake. What it's saying is the electric field at the point z equals zero, at the center of the semicircle, points in the minus j hat direction. And if you think about that for a moment, that's got to make sense, right? Because the electric field from this particular point is going to have two components. 
One is going to be in the minus j hat direction, and the other is going to be in the positive i hat direction. And then if you look at the electric field due to this point, and ask what is it at the center of the semicircle. It will have a contribution that goes like, uh, one component goes in the minus i hat direction and the second component goes in the minus j hat direction. And so this contribution, which is up, it's going to get canceled by that contribution, which is down. And the net effect is that you're going to have the contribution all pointing in the minus j hat direction. So this sign is correct. Okay. So I'll say this in words and leave it for the problem set. Another limiting case that you could explore is, well, look, you know what the answer is for a complete circular loop, right? At z equals zero or at z even non-zero. We did that last lecture. So if you repeat this calculation for the other part of the semicircle and add those two results together, then you should get what you know from lecture five. And I will leave that exercise. So there's another limiting case which we, we can explore. And I'll leave that to you as a problem in problem set six. Okay, so let's move on. Let's look at another example. And this is a pretty straightforward problem. There are two ways to do it. One way is the way we're gonna do it today analytically. The other way is to use Gauss's law, which we'll talk about next week. So the next problem we're gonna look at is an infinite plane of uniform surface charge density. Okay, so again, the system we're gonna look at, behooves us to draw a nice picture of it. Here are my unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat. And here's x axis, y axis, z axis. And what I will have is an infinite plane that's in the xy plane of surface charge density. And that surface charge density will be given the sig symbol sigma. He'll have units of charge coulombs per meter squared, so charge per area. So the charge is going to be spread out uniformly over the xy plane. So we're going to be doing all the action is going to be in the xy plane in terms of where the actual source charge or source charge distribution is. So it seems to me that again, we want to do this problem using cylindrical polar coordinates. And this is why we spend so much time going over these coordinate systems. So that when we actually look at these guys in applications, we know what we're doing. So all this should be secondhand to you. 
the big difference now is I'm not integrating over a line element of a circle or a semicircle. I'm integrating over a differential surface element ds. So again, cylindrical polar coordinates come to our rescue. Question is, what is ds? Well, we've done this problem before. In the xy plane, ds is just going to be this patch. This angle is just d phi. This is rho. So this ds is going to be a region of space and area that has a length of rho d phi and a width d rho. Okay. So that's what the differential surface element is in cylindrical polar coordinates. If you're shaky on this, you need to go back to problem set two and we can comment and lecture, make sure and you're okay. All right, I really claim that that's everything. You know, we've got everything set up and now we just simply have to formally do the, uh, set up the integral. Uh, we go back and do the electrostatics write down the expression for the electric field, set it up, evaluate it, and then do the integral. So for the moment, I'll keep the figure here. And I probably could put in the unit vectors i hat, j hat, and k hat. So again, what do we want to do? We want to find the electric field So what is the electric field at a particular point in space, namely at a point P, which is a distance Z above the origin. Um, we'll come back to this point later, but you know, even in doing these problems with these integrals, I can only do these problems at very special symmetry points. Can't do it everywhere. So I'm not asking what is the electric field here or here. I'm asking what's the electric field at point P. So that's a very special point of high symmetry. Okay, so I can write this down formally. What I have to do is recognize that the electric field, the total electric field at point Z is gonna be due to contributions due to small patches of charge inside differential surface elements ds. And I integrate that over the entire infinite plane. So just set a mouthful, let's back up. So I certainly know that this is true. I know again the same trick that I cannot pull the r hat outside of the integral. So I'm going to replace it by the vector r. Sorry, there's an r squared down there, of course. And so the denominator gets renormalized and becomes r cubed. So dq is simply going to be the surface charge density sigma, which in this example is a constant. That's why I have a, a uniform surface charge density times ds, that's my differential surface element, times r divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed. Actually, uh, let's save ourselves some space. Move this over and say that again. So the electric field is going to be dq times the position vector r 
divided by four pi epsilon naught r cubed. It's a vector, so let's make it look like a vector. And this is sigma ds r over four pi epsilon naught r cubed. Remember, sigma is a surface charge density. It has units of charge per area. ds is a differential surface element. He has units of area. If you multiply something, it goes like charge over area times area, you get a charge. So everything is right. Our dimensional analysis checks out. Finally, I know what ds is. It's simply rho d rho d phi. Sigma is a constant. Rho is clearly a variable. You, it's a variable of integration. Uh, phi is like a variable, so I have two variables to integrate over. And I need to write down an expression for the position vector and its magnitude. And I've actually done that before. So I'm going to get rid of my figure for a moment. I don't really need it right now. Um, I may bring it back. We'll see. So again, the electric field is going to look like save ourselves some work. Sigma over four pi epsilon naught rho d rho d phi. And again, I know what r hat. I know what r is. I know what the position vector is in cylindrical polar coordinates. So let's just write it down. It's minus i hat rho cosine phi minus j hat rho sine phi plus k hat z. We've done this three times already. This is the second time today, and we did it last time in lecture five. So we know how to write those vectors now. Okay, so what are my variables? Whenever I do an integral, I need to worry about the variables. Rho is certainly a variable, phi is a variable, and z is a constant. So same story. The answer formally breaks up into three parts. There are three separate integrals you have to do, e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3. You add them up, and that gives you the total electric field at that point p. Realize here's term one because there's an i hat there. So I have a vector equation on the right hand side here, and it has three parts. One is due to i hat times a whole lot of other terms. The other one has j hat times a whole lot of other terms, so that's two. And the third one is uh, this is a three. Third one due to k hat with other contributions. Okay, so same thing as before. Let's just do this systematically. Let's do E1 first. So it's going to look like minus sigma i hat over four pi epsilon naught. And I'm integrating over a surface, an infinite surface. So I have a double integral to do. The azimuthal angle is going to go from zero to two pi. And the angle over rho at distance is just going to go from minus, from zero to infinity. 
So on the integrand, the numerator goes like rho squared d rho, cosine phi, d phi, and the denominator goes like rho squared plus z squared, all to the three halves power. Again, z is fixed, it's a constant in this problem. Rho and phi are variables, or two variables. So this may look like a different, a, a difficult integral to do, and it's not if in fact you do the azimuthal angle first. You do the integration over the azimuthal angle first. So I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to pull this integral out, zero to infinity of rho squared d rho, divided by rho squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. I'm going to leave that alone. And I'm what I'm left is the integral of d phi cosine phi. And this goes from zero to 2 pi. If you do this, you'll sweep out the entire area of the infinite plane by doing the azimuthal angle and then integrating rho from zero to infinity. This integral is an elementary integral and it vanishes. Okay. So there's no contribution to e sub one. What about e sub two? Well, we're gonna do that. It has a very similar form. So we're gonna leave the expression for e sub one at the top of the board and just come back and modify it slightly. So that's E sub two. The modification comes by realizing that that second term has a J hat vector in it. That's one thing. And instead of having the cosine of B in the integrand, you have for that second term, the sine of phi. So E sub two, again, can be broken up. This is a surface integral, integral over two distinct variables, rho and phi. Let's break it up. Here's the rho integral first. It's rho squared d rho divided by rho squared plus z squared, all to the 3 halves power. And then I'm integrating from 0 to 2 pi over the azimuthal angle, which is just sine of phi d phi. So I claim, let's investigate the properties of this guy first. It's an elementary integral to do, and you discover that it vanishes. So uh, we're not getting any structure here, right? We found so far that E, the E sub one contribution vanishes, the E sub two contribution vanishes. We have a final contribution, E sub three, and let's just see what it is. I'm not gonna make any statements one way or another, no biases. So we'll write it out, E sub three, is plus sigma surface charge density k hat, excuse me, and there's a z, there is a four pi epsilon naught, and there's a double integral from zero to infinity and zero to pi, and I just have rho squared d rho over rho squared plus z to the 3 halves power. So this is an integral that you can evaluate by trigonometric substitution, very similar to a number of the problems that we looked at in problem sets, previous problem sets for practice exercises. I will um, give you some heads up of how to about, go about doing this by using trigonometric substitution, and I'll leave it to you to complete 
So if you look at the figure, so by looking at the original figure, The tangent of theta, remember where we defined theta, is just rho over z. So it's probably not a bad idea to rewrite that again. So so we go back to the original figure we wrote down earlier. Here's Z. It would be nice if we write down what we had. This is what we had last time. So here's theta. Here's R. Here's rho. Remember, R points from the differential surface element DS to the point in question, which we call P. So tangent of phi of theta is the opposite side over the adjacent. So rho equals z tangent phi. D rho is just z squared secant squared d theta. Um, one plus tangent of theta squared is the secant squared of theta, and that's the same thing as one plus rho squared over z squared, <coughs> excuse me. So rho squared plus z squared to the three halves power is just going to be, if I factor out a z squared, uh, then I take a square root and cube it, I get a z cubed. And that's going to be multiplied once I do the trigonometric substitution by secant cubed of theta. So all those are all the things I need to do now to do the integral. And I'll just write down the results at this stage, which we're finished essentially. So you should show that e sub three is the only guy that doesn't vanish, and it's just sigma k hat over two pi epsilon naught. So the electric field of an infinite sheet of charge of surface charge density sigma is a constant. Does it depend upon where you are above the infinite plane? It only has a direction that's in the k hat direction or if you want to write this in a more general form, the electric field has a value of sigma divided by two epsilon naught, and then it's multiplied by a unit normal vector to the surface. In hat. So I can't draw an infinite surface, but I can definitely draw a finite surface and then hat will look like that. So this is an extremely important point and go back and look at the infinite wire of uniform charge density that we talked about um, last time. It was also a simpler, a simple uh, result. And those two systems really are the two simplest systems you can look at in electrostatics, an infinite sheet of charge and an infinite wire. Okay, there's one last example I wanna to do today. And again, it's, it really is a modification of the problem we looked at last time in lecture five. So let me write it down first. So this looks very similar to a problem we talked about last time. I'll just put my coordinates in. 
So here I have a differential line element DL. Here I have X going to zero. And I'm going to pick my coordinate system so that I had goes in that direction and J hat goes in that direction. So what I will have here, I'll put it in red, is a half infinite line of linear charge density lambda. Okay. And so the question I want to ask here is what is E, what's the electric field at point P? And again, points are vectors. So this is different from what we saw previously in lecture five. I'm not looking at a wire that goes from minus infinity to infinity. I'm looking at a wire that goes from zero to infinity. So it's a half infinite wire. And again, it has no width to it. So it's the only thing I have to worry about is its length. Okay, so I'm here, so I might as well recognize this. This the differential line element is going to have a charge dq, but that's just simply the linear charge density times dl. Again, I'm here, so I might as well exploit this. R, the position vector, goes in that direction, so it must be minus i hat x plus k hat z. And r, its magnitude, is just going to be the square root of x squared plus z squared to one half. So whole, all of these housekeeping items uh, essentially come from the figure. And we know we're going to do this. We know we're going to need these folks when we actually sit down and try to calculate the electric field for this half infinite line. So again, in a lot of ways, this is a problem that we have done already. The difference is that the limits of the integration will be different. Rather than going from minus infinity to infinity along the x direction, or rather than x going from minus infinity to infinity for the infinite line of linear charge density lambda, this is a half infinite line. So the mechanism is going to be very similar, but we shouldn't be surprised that we'll get a different result. Okay. So again, this problem is a semi-infinite line. Of linear charge density lambda, which is constant. So that's important too, because you know, you could set up a model where the linear charge density is not constant, and that makes things a little bit more interesting or challenging. But first things first, we gotta learn how to crawl first before we can walk. Okay, so we can start to go through this a little bit more quickly. The electric field is again gonna be due to summing off d summing up de over the semi-infinite line this is going to be dq times r hat divided by four pi epsilon naught r squared i know what dq is it's just lambda dl and the same story r hat is not a constant she depends upon where you are in space so i can't pull it out of the interval what I can do is replace it by its position vector and the divided by the magnitude of that vector. So it will make the integration easy to do, but the price I pay is that the numerator denominator gets modified. So this integral will have two contributions. 
lambda comes outside, it's a constant. So lambda dl, four pi epsilon naught, there'll be a contribution due to minus i hat x and a contribution due to uh, j hat. Um, let me just go back and check something for a moment. Okay, so in this system, in this diagram, i hat was in that direction and k hat was there. So we go back to the figure. I'm not sure, I don't remember if I said this correctly, but I'll emphasize it again. This is i hat and this is k hat. This is no mystery. This is exactly what we did when we approached this problem last time. Okay. Back in lecture five. So I say all of that to say that this is a k hat z. And my denominator is just x squared plus z squared all to the three halves power. Uh, one other thing I need to recognize, dl, my differential line element is just dx. So this guy really didn't come outside the integral. It's there, so it stays inside. Okay, sorry for the typos. Okay, so from here on in, the problem is calculus. Uh, X is a variable. Z is a constant. I'll worry about the limits of integration later. I have two terms, one due to I hat and two due to K, uh, K hat. So let's do each one separately. So e sub 1 is going to be minus i hat lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught. The integrand contains x dx. So before I had pulled dx out outside of the integral, that was a foolish mistake. dx is dl, but that's not a constant. That's what you're integrating over. Now, here's a little interesting point. I'm doing this over a semi-infinite circle. I could be tempted to write this, but the problem is that infinity is not a number. And this formally is what's called an improper integral, when one of the limits of integration is infinity or minus infinity. And there, you gotta be careful when you handle those guys. So what I will do is make this what's called a proper integral. And the upper limit of integration will be L. I'll evaluate this, I'll get a final result, and then I'll take the limit of that final result as L goes to infinity. Okay. okay. Um, again, this is now a problem in calculus. This integral should not be mysterious to you. We've done this integral before. So I will, in problem set two, so I'll save us all some time and simply write down what it is up to a point. There's minus i hat lambda over four pi epsilon naught. There will be a factor of one over z out here. And there will be an integral from z, uh, of over theta from zero to L. So this is what you should get. And again, this is a elementary integral that you can solve by trigonometric substitution. And it's similar to one we did in problem set two. 
So, as I said, um, the simplest thing to do is to evaluate this thing first in terms of L. Now, if you go back and look at the figure, compare the figure, you can see that the cosine of theta is just z, the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. But that's just z divided by x squared plus z squared all to the one-half power. OK, so the rest is algebra. So when you're finished, you should get that e1 is lambda i hat over 4 pi epsilon naught z times z divided by L squared plus z squared to the one half power divided by one. So again, this is not the problem that we wanted to solve. This is the electric field due to the fact that the wire went from zero to L. We wanted a semi-infinite problem. So we wanted L to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And when it does, clearly this term vanishes because L is in the denominator. And so we're left with a minus lambda i hat 4 pi epsilon naught z. Make sure our units are right. Um, lambda goes like a charge over a distance, and I have another distance there. And so I know electric fields have to go like 1 over r squared. And so that's essentially right. I'll say a little bit more about this constant epsilon naught probably in the problem set. OK, um, you have this minus sign here. You may ask, well, is this correct? and the mathematics says it's correct, what I have to do now is figure out eventually whether or not it tells me something of physical importance. It turns out it will. Now, I'm not finished. I'm not finished because I still have to evaluate the second part, E sub 2. So let's write it out. It is k hat times lambda times z dx divided by 4 pi epsilon naught x squared plus z squared quantity to the 3 halves power. Again, x is my variable in this calculus problem. z is a constant. It's fixed. Okay. So I could simplify this. e sub 2 is k hat lambda z divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, all that's a constant, times dx over x squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. Again, we have seen this integral before in problem set 2. But I'll help you out. We're going to do this again by trigonometric substitution. So the tangent of theta will be defined as x over z. x will be z times the tangent of theta. dx, since z is a constant, you don't have to worry about it. You just treat it as a constant when you do the, take the derivative. So dx is just z secant squared theta d theta. x squared plus 
z squared to the 3 halves power can be simplified if you just factor out z or z squared. If you factor out z squared, you take its square root. Remember, this is 3 halves right here, so you won't see that in big letters, big symbols. So you take z squared, factor it out, you take its square root, you get z, then you cube it, and then you're left with 1 plus x over z squared all to the 3 halves power. Well, that's the same thing as z cubed times 1 plus tangent squared theta 3 halves. And that's the same thing as z cubed times the secant cubed of theta. We've done all this before, but it doesn't hurt to remind ourselves of what we're doing. Okay, so I can put all this together. E sub two is essentially gonna break down to lambda over k hat z over four pi epsilon naught. Once you do that trigonometric substitution, you'll get in the integral and integrand it just looks like cosine theta d theta. We're gonna use the same trick we're not going to use infinity as the upper limit of integration because that's an improper integral. We'll replace it by L, which is finite. We'll get a result, and then we'll take the limit of that result as L goes to infinity. Okay, a little bit more work to do. You should see, convince yourself that this is true, that the diagram for this problem, so figures tell you a lot. When you write down the figure very carefully, it reveals all the secrets of how to solve the problem, or most of them, or a good deal. Cosine of theta is going to be z divided by x squared plus z squared to the one half power. We used this previously to evaluate e sub one. Sine of theta, we're going to use that here, is going to be x divided by x squared plus z squared to the one half power. And these two are gonna make it, these two expressions will make a difference. Z in this problem is a constant, but x is not, it's a variable. So if you put all this together, you're gonna find that the electric field goes like lambda z k hat divided by four pi epsilon naught, there will be a factor of uh, z cubed, which I have omitted here. So there's a factor here of z squared. which is going to come out. So at the end of the day, you're just going to get a factor of z in the denominator. And you should check this. Okay. So these guys are correct. And then I have an integral from zero to L of cosine theta d theta. And actually, um, I mean, I skipped a number of steps just to save time. There's probably a warning in doing that. That's really z squared. And this is going to be evaluated as lambda k hat L divided by four pi epsilon naught z times L squared plus z squared raised to the one half power. So this is in fact correct. This is in fact correct. This is in fact correct. I've 
omitted some steps in lecture, but I leave it to you to verify that they are correct. Now, this is not the final result. This is the electric field for a finite wire of uniform charge density, uniform charge density lambda. But again, it depends on L. So to get my final answer, I need to take the limit of this as L goes to infinity. Now you may say, oh, wait a minute, I got a problem here because L is in the, the, the numerator, it's in the denominator, and so this whole expression should blow up. The electric field should go like infinity. Well, not so fast. You're not taking this limit correctly. So let's rewrite the expression. E sub two, we said is lambda k hat L divided by four pi epsilon naught z. And then I have an expression L squared plus z squared to the one half power in the denominator. So let's simplify that guy in square brackets in the denominator. The way I will do that is I will factor out L squared. I uh, take its square root and I just get an L. And that's multiplied by one plus Z squared over L squared. And it's clear here, in the limit that L gets bigger and bigger, this second term vanishes with respect to one. So at the end of the day, this is just going to go to L. That's nice because what will happen as a consequence of that is that the L's will disappear and we'll simply get two K hat lambda over four pi, oh, this two is a typo, sorry. So we get k hat lambda divided by four pi epsilon naught z. And there is no L dependence at all. Okay, so I have my two results of the problem. Let's put them all together. The electric field is minus I hat lambda divided by four pi epsilon naught z plus lambda k hat divided by four pi epsilon naught z. That is my final result. And again, please verify that. Now this looks complicated. Uh, first of all, it has the right units, right? I have a surface charge density, a linear charge density, lambda, that goes like one over a charge over a length. I have a length downstairs, so this goes like one over a length squared. So it's, the units are working right for an electric field. But I would like to ask an important question. What does this answer mean? I mean, it looks complicated, but it's telling me something. What is it telling me? What is it revealing? So again, if you go back and look at the figure, I had a unit vector minus I hat in that direction and a unit vector plus K hat in that direction. Here's my point P. And I have found that the electric field due to a semi-infinite wire of linear charge density lambda has two terms or two contributions. One is in the minus i hat direction and the other is in the plus k hat direction. So I know that my electric field will be a vector field and at every point I can calculate what the electric field is. Here it is. But I would like to sit back for a moment and ask, what about this angle that E makes with the unit vector minus I hat? Is there anything that I can say about that angle? 
Well, I can, if I just go back and use what I know from vector analysis. If I take the dot product of E with minus I hat, I get the norm of E times the norm of minus I hat times the cosine of the angle in between them. The norm of E, I can just get from this expression. I take this vector, dot it into itself, and then take the square root of the result. I'll get a scalar. That scalar I will get will be the square root of two times lambda over four pi epsilon naught z. So you can verify that. So all this says is that E dotted into minus i hat is really going to be the square root of two lambda divided by four pi epsilon naught z times the cosine of theta. The norm of minus the unit vector, the norm of any unit vector is one. But I recognize that from this expression at the top, another way to write down the dot product of E with the unit vector minus I hat is just simply to take minus I hat and dot it into both sides of this equation. I get no contribution from the K hat term. So I will just get lambda. Get rid of that. I'll just get lambda. Do all this in black. I'll just get lambda divided by four pi epsilon naught z. So what is all this telling me? What all of this is telling me is that the cosine of theta has to be equal to one over the square root of two. And let's jump back for a minute and just use some geometry to figure out what that's telling me. So the cosine of theta is one over the square root of two. So let's just use some elementary geometry. Uh, this is not drawn to scale, so let me draw it to scale. So here is a triangle. It's a right triangle. These sides are equal. Pythagorean theorem tells me that this side, the hypotenuse, is just the square root of two times a. These angles must be 45 degrees. The sum of all the three angles in a triangle is 180 degrees, so 90 degrees plus 45 degrees, so 45 degrees is 180. So the cosine of 45 degrees is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And so that tells me that theta is always going to be a constant. It's going to be 45 degrees. So let's go back to the physical problem. Physical problem was, I had my wire. Again, this is the K hat direction. This is the I hat direction. I had that confused a little bit. A few slides back. And actually, I'm not even going to put this in here. Here's X. Here's Z. And here is my charged semi-infinite wire. It goes from zero and goes all the way out to infinity. And has linear charge density lambda. So what I've discovered is, is that there is going to be an electric field at a point Z due to wherever you are. So I don't really, I mean, I've added all these guys up, so I don't 
really need to specify. But at this point here, there will be a series of electric fields. They will have different magnitudes. In fact, the magnitudes will decrease as X gets bigger and bigger. But each one of these vector fields will always make an angle of 45 degrees with the x-axis. And that's remarkable. I find that remarkable. That's what this answer tells you. So again, the electric field has this complicated form. But when you evaluate the angle between the electric field and the x-axis, it's always going to be equal to a constant. Now, that just gives us some meaning or some justification that this expression means something or makes some sense. But still, you know, I'd like to be comfortable in figuring out can I really pin this guy down and look at a limiting case? In the last four minutes of today's lecture, we'll do that. So we'll look at a limiting case to see if we can explain what's going on here. So if the wire goes from zero to infinity, we have calculated that it's minus alpha, minus lambda, i hat 4 pi epsilon naught z plus lambda k hat divided by 4 pi epsilon naught z. And that's the problem we've done today. Now, you could, and again, this wire is a semi-infinite wire. But it's not the only wire in the problem, or it's not the only it's infinite, it's not the only semi-infinite wire that you could consider. Suppose you decided to calculate the electric field from a wire that went from minus x to zero. We haven't done this. This is not the problem that we're doing, but I'm gonna ask you to do this. Everything we just talked about, and it's a good exercise to go through because that'll show that you understand what the problem is asking how to do this. So you need to do this. And there is a reason why we're going through this. The reason why we're going through this is the principle of superposition is going to tell us that we are working in the right direction, then we have the right limiting case. If you add these two results up, namely if you have the result of the electric field from zero to infinity, x goes from zero to infinity, that's one term, we've done that today, we've done that in lecture six, and then I ask you to do a separate problem of calculating the electric field due to a semi-infinite wire. But now the wire is going to go from minus infinity to zero. You'll get a different result. And the principle of superposition says that if you want to get the case of the infinite wire, you just add these two semi-infinite cases together and you discover something amazing. This minus sign is canceled out by that plus sign. So that means something. Those are not typographical errors, not just mathematical symbols. It tells you something physically. And when you add this together, you'll get two lambda k hat over four pi epsilon naught z. And this is exactly what we saw last time in lecture five. 
this is the electric field of an infinite wire of linear charge density lambda. That's what lambda means. Okay. So again, this is a very interesting problem that you can do. It really breaks down to doing the limits of integration correctly. It's similar to what we did previously. But superposition tells you something fundamental and important. You want to calculate the electric field of an infinite wire you get the same answer if you calculate the electric field due to one semi-infinite wire and add it up to another, add it to another semi-infinite wire. And that's exactly what you see here. And if you go back and look at lecture five, we calculated this expression. Okay, so three problems, three examples, one or two typos on my part, my apologies. Go back and review this lecture very carefully. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. Um, this is gonna be the format really for a while. What we're gonna be doing in lecture is we'll be going through lots of examples and lots of problems in some detail. And when we need to discuss some theory, we'll talk about it, but at a very low level, not so much low level, but we'll talk about it briefly. If we have to expound upon the theory, we'll do that in the problem sets. So next time, we're going to look at a way to calculate electric fields of systems that have very, very high symmetry. That is a technique due to Carl Frederick Gauss. It's called Gauss's Law. And we're going to go through several, several examples of how that goes. So in summary, problem set five, the solution key will be available on the Google Drive by next Monday. And problem, six, six, problem set six will be available uh, Tuesday, probably early afternoon on Tuesday. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that concludes lecture six. So any questions or comments? Um, this starts our recitation section and I'm available for uh, questions on problem set, questions on lecture material, um, easily for the next half hour or easily up to five, depending upon uh, people have questions. Okay, comments, questions, problems? Hey Steve, I don't know where everyone is today. I think people- must So let me, let me stop. Should I stop? Yeah.